Hello, welcome back. I'm gonna have a little read of this Playboy magazine from 1968, November. 75 cents. Well, would you look at that. Oh, an interview. Aldridge Cleaver. Never heard of him. A candid conversation with the revolutionary leader of the Black Panthers. Ooh. If we don't get justice in the courts, we'll get it in the streets. If atrocities against us continue unpunished, if police aggress aggress aggression is not stopped, more and more blacks may have to fight gunfire with gunfire. Our basic demand is for proportionate participation in the real power that runs this country. Decision making, power concerning, all legislation, all appropriations, foreign policy, every area of life. What can whites do? Be Americans. Stand up for liberty. Stand up for justice. Stand up for the underdog. That's supposed to be the American way. Make this really the home of the free. Alright, alright. Alright, here's some questions Playboy asked this guy. Okay. You have written that the new black leadership, with its own distinct style and philosophy, will now come into its own, to center stage. Nothing can stop this leadership from taking over, because it is based on charisma, has the allegiance and support of the black mess masses, is conscious of itself, and its position is prepared to shoot its way to power if the need arises. As one who is increasingly regarded as among the pivotal figures in the new black leadership, how do you distinguish the new breed from those such as Roy Wilkins and Whitney Young? Most Americans consider the established Negro spokesman. Well, Cleaver writes, the so-called, well says, the so-called leaders you name have been willing to work within the framework of the rules laid down by the white establishment. They have tried to bring change within the system as it, it, as it, as it now is, without violence. Although Martin Luther King was the leader spokesman for the non-violent theme, all the rest condemn violence too. Furthermore, all are careful to remind everybody that they're Americans as well as Negroes. That the prestige of this country is as important to them as it is to whites. Since you consider yourself one of these new leaders representing the masses, what are your specific goals? Well, our basic demand is for proportionate participation in the real power that runs this country. This means that black people must have part of the decision-making power concerning all legislation, all appropriations of money, foreign policy, every area of life. We cannot accept anything less than that. Black people, like white people, have the best lives technology is able to offer at the present time. Black people know what's going on. They're aware of this country's productivity and they want on the good life. How much time is there for these demands to be met before this takes place? I don't know what the band's talking about, but what will happen and when will Oh fuck's sakes. What will happen and when will depend on the dynamics of the revolutionary struggle in the black and white communities. People are going to do what they feel they have to do as the movement takes shape and gathers strength. But how long do you expect black people who are already fed up to endure the continued indifference of the federal government to their needs? How long will they endure the continued escalation of police force and brutality? But we repeat, isn't this already happening at least on a small scale? There's a black mayor of Cleveland. Carl Stokes and a black mayor of Gar 
Gary, a black mayor of Gary, Richard Hatcher. Well, you're talking about black personalities, not about basic changes in the system. There is a large and deeping and deepening layer of black people in this country who cannot be tricked anymore by having a few black... Oh my goodness. By having a few black faces put up front. Let me make this very clear. We are demanding structural changes in society and that means a real redistribution of power so that we have control over our own lives. Having a black mayor in the present situation doesn't begin to accomplish that. And this is a question of more than breaking out of poverty. If this civil and guerrilla war does take place, on what do you base your assertion that there will be thousands of white John Browns fighting on the side of the blacks? Well, because we recognize that there are a lot of white people in this country who want to see virtually a new world dawn here in North America, in the Bay Area alone. There are thousands of whites who have taken fundamental stands on certain issues, particularly on our demand to free Husi Hui. Newton, a person who can relate to that, who can move himself to understand the issues involved, is a person who has begun on a path of essential commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Here we go, here we go. I see some. When? And if it comes to the possibility of large-scale violence, won't most of these essentially middle-class whites, even those you call the hardcore retreat? You have to realize how deep the radicalization of young whites can become as the agents of repression against both them and us intensify their efforts. It's inevitable that the police, in order to suppress black militants, will also have to try to destroy the base of their support in the white community. When they arrest the black leader of the liberation struggle, they will also have to deal with the protests and the exposure of what they've done in certain white communities. And as they do, they will radicalize more whites. And how is that? That's the issue and the dilemma. How to find a revolutionary mode of moving in this most complicated of all situations. The people who supported McCarthy found out that wasn't the way. I'm not saying we, the Black Panthers, have the answer either, but we're trying to find a way. One thing we do know is that we have to bring a lot of those, these loosely connected elements of opposition into an organized framework. You can't have an armor furious thing pulling in all directions and realistically call it a revolutionary movement. That's why we're organizing among blacks and attend the Panthers to be the black national movement. Have you considered the possibility that you could be wrong about the chances of waging a successful guerrilla war? Don't you run the risk that all your efforts toward that end, even if they don't escalate beyond rhetoric, could invite a massive wave of repression that would result in a black bloodbath and turn the country's ghettos into a concentration camps? Well, it seems to me a strange assumption that black people could just be killed or cooped up into concentration camps, and that would be the end of it. This isn't the 1930s. We're not going to play Jews. The whole world is different now from what it was then. Not only would black people resist with the help of white people, but we would also have the help of those around the world who are just waiting for some kind of extreme crisis within this country so they, they can move for their own liberation from American repression abroad. This government does not have unlimited forces of repression. It can't hold the whole world down, not at home and abroad. Eventually it will be able to control the racial situation here only by ignoring its military commitments overseas. That might stop our movement for a while, but think what would be happening in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. In that event, there would be a net gain for freedom in the world.
Not even in the midst of large-scale violence in which white neighborhoods were being burned and looted, white children being endangered. Under those circumstances, it might be very possible for the power structures to capitalize sufficiently on white fear and anger to justify such atrocities even against those not involved in the violence. But there would, but there would still be elements in the white community that would resist ma that would resist massive and indiscriminate rep repression of all blacks. And once the immediate causes of fear and anger were over. I believe the majority would begin to protest and eventually move against mass imprisonment and genocide. Suppose you're right in claiming the most, well, that most whites, for whatever reason, would not support massive repression of blacks in this country. These same whites, however, don't want black violence either. But as you point out, most don't fully grasp the dimensions of the injustice injustices against which that violence is a rebellion nor do they understand why it continues in the wake of several milestone civil rights laws and supreme court decisions the familiar question is what more do they want how would you answer it i can only answer with what malcolm x said if you've had a knife in my back for 400 years am i supposed to thank you for pulling it out because that's all those laws and decisions have accomplished. The very least of your responsibility now is to compensate me. However, inadequately for centuries of degradation and disenfranchisement by granting peacefully before I take them forcefully the same rights and opportunities for a decent life that you've taken for granted as an American birthright. Yippee, yippee, yippee. Have you considered the consequences to society of opening the prisons and sending all the inmates free their behavior may in one sense be society's fault but they're still criminals we don't feel that there's any black man or any white man in any prison in this country who could be compared in terms of criminality with Lyndon Johnson no mass murder in any penitentiary in America or in any other country comes anywhere close to the thousands and thousands of deaths for which Johnson is responsible would you feel that way if it were your store that got held up? That's inconceivable. I wouldn't own a store. But for the sake of argument, let's say I did. I'd still respect the guy who came in and robbed me more than the panhandler who mooched a dime from me in the street. But would you feel he was justified in robbing you because of his disadvantaged social background? Yes, I would. And this form of social rebellion is on the rise. When I went to San Quentin in 1958, black people constituted about 8-30% of the prison population. Recently, I was back at San Quentin, and the blacks are now in a the majority. There's an incredibly, incredible number of black people coming in with each new load of prisoners. Moreover, I've talked to a lot of other people who've been in different, different prisons. And the percentage of black inmates there, too, is indisputably climbing. And within that growing number, the percentage of young black prisoners is increasing most of all. Youngsters from all ages of 18 to 23 are clearly in the majority of the new people who come to prison. The reason is that for a lot of black people, including the young jobs, including the young, jobs are almost non-existent and the feeling of rebellion is particularly powerful among the young. What about your own problems with the law? If you weren't the author of Soul on Ice, is it likely that you'd still be in prison? Certainly. If I had been just another black man, I wouldn't have had a chance in the world of getting out before my maximum sentence was served. Especially not me, because I was involved in a lot of prison politics. You know, the prison authorities consciously create and maintain a certain level of hostility among the various racial groups in prison. There is, for example, a, prefer a preferential, pre preferential, oh, what's that word? Preferential order on jobs. Well, white prisoners get the best ones, and white prisoners do less time than black inmates for similar crimes. 
In the California prisons, the preferential order is whites, Mexican Americans, and then blacks. There's always been a lot of agitation within the prisons to change that. I was involved in that agitation, and as a result, I was told by members of the probation authority that I could just forget about getting out of prison until my entire 14-year term was up. You seem to alternate between advocating revolutionary violence and allowing for the possibility of social reform without violence. Which is it going to be? What happens, as I've said, will depend on the continuing dynamics of the situation. What we're doing now is telling the government that if it does not do its duty, then we will see to it ourselves that justice is done. Again, I can't tell you when we may have to start defending ourselves by violence from continued violence against us. That will depend on what is done against us and on whether real change can be accomplished nonviolently within the system. We'd much rather do it that way because we don't feel it would be a healthy situation to have even black revolutionaries going around distributing justice. I'd much prefer a society in which we wouldn't have to use or even carry guns, but that means the pigs would have to be disarmed too. Do you have any reason to believe that the United Nations would consider holding such a plebiscite? 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 We already know there are a lot of countries in the world that sympathize with the black cause in America and would be willing to support us on this question. Is the political situation worsens? Is it inevitably must both? Domestically and internationally, we feel we will be able to persuade enough nations to place the idea of a plebiscite on the agenda of a general assembly, just as so many colonized peoples in other parts of the world have been able to do. After all, we're dealing with a black population in this country that outnumbers that of many UN member nations. Do you agree with those who feel that this generation of youth is going to sell out to the status quo as it moves into middle age? I expect all of us will become somewhat less resilient as we get into our 40s and 50s if we live that long. And I'm sure that those who come after us will look back on us as being conservative, even us panthers. But I don't think this generation will become as rigid as the ones before. And for that matter, I don't write off all older people right now. There are a lot of older whites and blacks who keep working for change. So there are people over 30 I trust. I'm over 30 and I trust me. As you know, however, there are many who do and who believe he really meant what he said that night. In reaction to his and Jones' remarks, one young white radical wrote in Rat Subterranean News, the underground New York bi-weekly, you are denying my humanity and my individuality. Though I am in deepest empathy with you and with all blacks, all people in their struggle to be free, you are in danger of becoming my enemy. I must revolt against your racism and your scorn of everything white, just as I revolt against the racism of white America. I will not let you put me in a bag. Your enemies and my enemies are the same people. The same institutions. I feel no special loyalty to white, but only self. I feel no love for the leaders or institutions or culture of this country, but only for individual people in an ever-growing number with whom I share love and trust. I deny my whiteness. I affirm my humanity. You are urging your black brothers to see me only as white. In just the same way as we have been raised to see you only as Negro. I don't feel white enough or guilty enough to die joyfully by a bullet from a black man's gun. Crying absolved at last. And I know that soon you, by denying me my meanness, will become for me just as much as in oppression, just as much as an enemy as the white culture. We are 
both fighting to remain free and to transform society. And I have to maintain my hard, hard won differentiation from the mass of white people. And I won't let even a black person, no matter how hard bent he be on black liberation, squeeze me back into honky dom. If I have to shoot a black racist one of these days, well, baby, that's part of the struggle. This rejection of racism has been echoed by many young whites. What's your reaction to it? Whoa, 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 whoa. I think it's a commendable statement. But there are many whites who do deny the humanity of black people. And I think Leroy and Bobby were talking about them. If you're white and you don't fall into that bag, though, there is no reason why you should accept that endless as applying to you. You have to judge people by what they do. Those white people who are still functioning as part of the juggernaut of oppression are indeed guilty. But those who place themselves outside the system of oppression, those who struggle against that system ought not to consider that judgment applied against them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Holy Jesus. And these criminals are to be killed if there's a violent revolution. It seems to be a hallmark of any revolutionary war that the worst culprits are stood up against the wall and executed. Granted, there have been conflicts between the Panthers and the police, but aren't you exaggerating their intent when you claim, as you did recently, that they're out to systematically eliminate our leadership? Not in the least. We are a great threat to the police and to the whole white power structure in Alameda County and in Oakland, where the Panthers were born. The police are the agents of the power structure in trying to destroy us. Let me give you the background. When Bobby Seale and Huey Newton organized the Black Panther Party in October 1966, they initiated armed black patrols. Each car, which had four men, would follow the police around observing them. When police accosted a citizen on the street and started doing something wrong to him, the patrol would be there as witnesses and to tell the person being mistreated what his rights were. In this way, the Panthers focused community attention on the police and the people learned they didn't have to submit to the kind of oppressive, arbitrary brutality that had been directed against the black people in Oakland for a long time. What about the widely publicized shooting of April 6th in which 17-year-old Black Panther Bobby Hutton was killed and two others, including yourself, were wounded? The official version has been circulated in the daily newspapers. Can you give your account of what happened? Certain points I can't discuss because I don't want to alert the prosecution to what we're going to bring out in court, but I'll give you the basic details. April 6 was a Saturday. We were going to have a barbecue picnic the next day, a black community picnic in Oakland. We'd been leaflet leafleting the community and driving around in sound trucks, urging people to attend the picnic. And that night, we were involved in getting the food together, cooking the meat, picking up potatoes for potato salad and all that. During the preceding days, We'd been having continuous trouble with the Oakland Police Department about the picnic. They tried to prevent our getting a permit to hold it. And although we got it after three or four days, there were severe restrictions on what we could do. No political speeches, no leafleting, things like that. This harassment and interference with our constitutional rights was nothing new. It happened with all the fundraising events we planned. The police knew about them immediately and always started a massive arrest so that whatever money we'd raised would be drained off in bail and legal fees. Anyway, this picnic was especially important to us because we badly needed money for the Huey Newton Defense Fund and for political campaigns. Bobby Seal was running for the state assembly and Huey was running for Congress from jail. We'd come through all the police interference until that Saturday. That night, I was driving a car that had been lent to us by a white man. 
It was a white Ford with Florida license plates, and for days before, and for days before, Panthers who had been driving that car were constantly stopped by cops and questioned, Are you from Florida? Where did you get this car? All kinds of silly annoyances, obviously. They were always on the lookout for that car. While driving in that Saturday night on the way to a Panthers apartment, where, where we were assembling all the food. I had to take a piss, so I pulled over on the dark street and got out of the car. The two other Panthers cars in the caravan stopped behind me. Just then, this police car came around the corner. I didn't know at first it was a police car because it was very dark and the car was some distance away. I was only concerned that somebody was coming and it would be embarrassing to be caught standing there taking a leak. So I went around to the other side of the car. All of a sudden, a squad car turned the spotlight on me and the cops started yelling, Come out from behind there! Well, I was in the middle of taking this leak, so it took me a little time to get my fly zipped up and to get out into the middle of the street. Just as I cleared the front of my car, these cops started shooting. How did you know it was the police who started shooting? Because all the Panthers were behind me and all the shots came from in front of me where the cops were, and the shots were aimed at me. There's absolutely no question about it. You've also been a spokesman for the plea, for the Peace and Freedom Party, of which you were this year's presidential nominee. How significant do you consider that kind of political activity in terms of your plans for the growth of the Black Panthers? Well, I never exactly dreamed of waking up in the White House after the November election, but I took part in that campaign because I think it's necessary to pull a lot of people together. Black and white certainly were concerned with building the Black Panther Party. But we also have to build a national coalition between white activists and black activists. Is uh, uh, ooh. Among the manifestations of that new pride is a decline in social acceptability of the word Negro in favor of the terms Afro-American and black. Is that why you don't call yourself on the Panthers? Is that why you don't call yourself? Is that why you don't call yourself or the Panthers? Negroes? I accept the analysts, the Muslims, and the particularly Malcolm X have made of the term Negro. It's a word that whites applied to black people who were kidnapped from Africa. And historically the term and historically the term came to mean a came to mean a docile, submissive slave type of person. Afro Afro American and black, however, signify a rebellious person who finds and takes on his own identity. If you are imprisoned or killed, how much confidence do you have that the Black Panther Party or any succeeding group in the revolutionary struggle will ultimately prevail? I have confidence that people learn from the experience of, uh, experiences of others. Every time a black man is murdered for speaking out against oppression, his death is fuel for the struggle to continue. Playboy After Hours, what is this? Well, I'll take a read of that in the next part. I don't know what it is. No questions, but that's the end of what's his name? Clarence Ed Cleaver. Aldridge Cleaver. That's his name. See you, Aldridge. Have a good one. See you, everybody. Bye-bye.